Hello, in this lecture we will look at CPU scheduling algorithms. We had seen uh, in operating systems that a scheduler present would choose a particular process from the ready queue and that process is assigned to run in the processor. Now the question that we were going to analyze now is how should this scheduler choose the next process? Essentially, how should the scheduler choose a process to run on the CPU from the existing queue of ready processes? Now to analyze this, we first look at execution phases of a process. Now any program has been known to have two phases of execution. One is when it is actually executing instructions, which is known as a CPU burst, while the other is when it is blocked on an I.O. or not doing any operations. So in this particular case, the CPU is idle. Thus, as we look with over time, a particular process would have some amount of uh, CPU burst in which it would execute instructions on the processor. Uh, then it would have an, some idle time in which it is waiting for an I.O. operation. Then there would be a burst of CPU time and so on. Thus, there is always this interleaving between CPU bursts and idle time that is waiting for an operation. So based on this phases of execution, one can classify processes into two types. One is the I.O. bound processes while the other is the CPU bound process. Why do you make this distinction between I.O. bound and CPU bound processes? Essentially this is from a scheduling perspective. We would like to give I.O. bound processes a higher priority with which they are allocated the CPU. Essentially we want that I.O. bound processes wait lesser time for the CPU compared to CPU bound processes. So why is this required? We can take with an example. So suppose we are, we are using a word processor such as a notepad or VIM and we are giving this I.O. bound process uh, a very low priority. Now suppose a user presses a key because it has a low priority, it does not get the CPU too uh, very often and therefore it would take some time before that key pressed by the user appears onto the screen. So this may be quite uncomfortable for the user. Therefore, we would like to give the I.O. bound process such as the word processor higher priority with which it will get the CPU so that the user interaction with the CPU becomes more comfortable. On the other hand, if we look at CPU bound processes, we could give it a lower priority. Now for instance, if you take one of these uh, applications, uh, the CPU bound applications like for instance, say let us say GCC that is compiling a program and let us say you are compiling a large program which takes 5 minutes. Now it will not affect this user much if the time taken to compile that particular program increases from 5 minutes to say 5.5 minutes. Thus. Uh, CPU bound processes could work with a lower priority. This classification between I.O. bound and CPU bound is not a rigid classification. That is a process could be an I.O. bound process at one time and after some time it could behave like a CPU bound process. So to take an example of a process which behaves both like an I.O. bound as well as CPU bound, uh, you could take for instance Microsoft Excel. When we are actually entering data into the various cells in Excel, it acts as I.O. bound process. So it behaves like an I.O. bound process with small CPU bursts and large times of I.O. cycles. While on the other hand, when you are actually computing some uh, statistic on the data entered, uh, Excel will behave like a CPU bound process where there is a large portion of CPU activity or the time taken to actually operate on that particular data. Now let us come back to the question about how the CPU scheduler should choose from the queue of ready processes the next process to execute in the CPU. There could be several ways in which the scheduler could make this choice. Es essentially there could be several CPU scheduling algorithms which would look into the queue and make a particular decision. So in order to compare these various scheduling algorithms, uh, operating systems textbooks or uh, operating systems research define several scheduling criteria. So these criteria could be used to actually compare various 
scheduling algorithms to see the advantages and disadvantages of each of them. So, let us go through each of these scheduling criteria one by one. The first scheduling criteria is the CPU utilization. The scheduling algorithm should be designed in such a way so as to maximize CPU utilization. In other words, the CPU should be idle as minimum time as possible. The next criteria we will look at is the throughput. Essentially, scheduling algorithms would try to complete as many processes as possible per unit time. A third criteria is the turnaround time and this criteria is looked at from a single process perspective. So, turnaround time is defined as the time taken for a single process from start to completion. The fourth criteria is response time. So, this is defined as the time taken from the point that when the process enters into the ready queue to the point when the process goes into the running state. That is the time taken from the instant the process enters the ready queue to the time the CPU begins to execute instructions corresponding to that process. Another criteria is the waiting time. Now, this criteria is based on the time taken by a process in the ready queue. Now, as we know processes ready to run are present in the ready queue and it is required that they do not wait too long in the ready queue. So, scheduling algorithms could be designed in such a way that the waiting time or the average waiting time in the ready queue is minimized. The final criteria we will see now is fairness. The scheduler should ensure that each process is given a fair share of the CPU based on some particular policy. So, it should not be the case that some process for instance takes say 90 percent of the CPU while all other processes just get around 10 percent of the CPU. So, all these criteria need to be considered while designing a scheduling algorithm for an operating system. A single scheduling algorithm will not efficiently be able to cater to all these criteria simultaneously. So, therefore, scheduling algorithms are therefore designed for to meet a subset of these criteria. For instance, uh, if you consider a real time operating system, the scheduling algorithm for that system would for instance be designed to have minimum response time. Other factors such as uh, CPU utilization and throughput may be of secondary importance. On the other hand, a desktop operating system like uh, Linux should uh, will be designed for fairness. So, that all applications running in the CPU or in the system are given a fair share of the CPU. Criteria such as uh, response time may be less important from that perspective. So, we will now look at several scheduling algorithms starting from the simplest one that is the first come first serve scheduling algorithm and go to more complex scheduling algorithms as we proceed. So, let us look at the first come first serve of the FCFS scheduling algorithm. The basic scheme in this case is that the first process that requests the CPU would be allocated the CPU or in other words the first process which enters into the ready queue would be allocated the CPU. So, this is a non preemptive scheduling algorithm which means that the process once allocated the CPU will continue to execute in the CPU until its burst cycle completes. Let us see this with an example. Let us say we have uh, a system with four processes running. The processes are labeled P 1, P 2, P 3, P 4 and they have an arrival time. So, the arrival time is present in the second column. So, the arrival time is defined as the time when these processes enter into the ready queue. So, for this particular uh, very simple example, so we will uh, consider that the that all processes enter the ready queue at the same time that is at the 0th time instant. The third column is the CPU burst time. So, it gives the amount of uh, CPU burst for each process. For instance, P 1 has a CPU burst of 7 cycles, uh, P 2 has a burst of 4 cycles. Thus, this particular table we have like 4 processes which all 
enter simultaneously into the ready queue at the time instance 0 and they have different CPU burst times. For instance, uh, uh, P 1 has 7 cycles, uh, P 2 4 cycles, P 3 2 cycles and P 4 5 cycles. Now, we will see how uh, these 4 processes get scheduled into the CPU or how these 4 processes get allocated the CPU. Since all of these processes arrive at the same time, the scheduler does not actually have a choice to make. So, he would pick randomly a particular order. For instance, let us say the scheduler picks P 1 to run. Uh, so, P 1 runs for 7 cycles and when it completes the scheduler picks P 2 and P 2 runs for 4 cycles. After uh, P 2 completes its burst, then P 3 uh, executes in the CPU for 2 cycles and then finally, P 4 is scheduled in uh, to execute for 5 CPU cycles. So, this is represented by a grant chart. So, a grant chart is a horizontal bar chart developed as a production tool in 1917 by Henry L. Grant, who was an American engineer and a social scientist. So, essentially in a grant chart, we have like several blocks over here and each block represents a cycle of execution. So, for instance, P 1 executes for 7 cycles. So, it has like 7 blocks 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh, P 2 then executes for 4 cycles. So, it is given like 4 blocks, then P 3 executes for 2 cycles. So, it is given 2 blocks and finally, P 4 executes for 5 blocks, uh, 5 cycles. So, it is given 5 blocks. So, we could compute the average waiting time for this particular case. We see that process P 1 enters into the ready queue at the instant 0 and immediately gets to execute in the CPU. Thus, it does not have to wait at all. The second process P 2 arrives also at 0 that is also arrives at this point, but gets to execute only after P 1 executes that is after 7 cycles. Thus, its wait time is for process P 2 is 7. Similarly, process P 3 which also enters in the 0th cycle gets to execute only after process P 1 and P 2 completes. In other words, it has to wait 11 cycles. In the fourth process in a similar way needs to wait for 13 cycles. Therefore, the average waiting time in this particular case is 7.75 cycles. Now, we can look at an other scheduling criteria which is the average response time. So, average response time in this case is the same as the average waiting time. So, the average response time is the time taken for a particular process to begin executing in the CPU minus the time it actually enters into the ready queue. So, for instance, P 2 enters into the ready queue at this instant, but begins to execute in the CPU only after 7 cycles. So, therefore, the response time for uh, process P 2 is 7. Similarly, process P 3 has a response time of 11 because it has waited for 11 cycles to actually begin executing in the CPU. So, on average the average response time is 7.75 just like the average waiting time. Now, one characteristic of the FCFS scheduling algorithm is that the order of scheduling matters. In the previous slide, that is in this slide, we had assumed that P 1 executes, then P 2 executes, then P 3 and then P 4. And uh, we have got a uh, average waiting time and average response time of 7.75 cycles. Now, suppose we just change the ordering and let us say the ordering is now as follows that P 2 executes, then P 3 executes, uh, then P 4 and finally, P 1. In such a case, if we compute the average waiting time, it we see that it gets reduced from 7.75 cycles to 5.25 cycles. Similarly, if you compute the average response time, you will see that the response time is also 5.25 cycles. In a similar way, you could compute the other criteria which we have mentioned over here and you will be able to actually see the difference with the two ordering schemes. 
Another characteristic of the FCFS scheduling algorithm is the convoy effect. Essentially, in this particular case, we see that all processes wait for one big process to get off the CPU. So, uh, for instance, in this case, until or rather, even though all processes enter the CPU at the same time, all processes have to wait for P1 to complete, only then that they could be scheduled. So, if we have a large process over here, for instance, we have a uh, a process P1 instead of a burst time of 7 takes a burst time of, of say 100, all other processes P2, P3 and P4 would wait for 100 clock cycles before they actually be able to get to execute in the CPU. So, this is a huge drawback of the FCFS scheduling scheme. However, FCFS uh, scheduling algorithm have several advantages. The first thing is it is extremely simple. So, the scheduling algorithm could complete very quickly and therefore, the time taken by the scheduling algorithm will be very less and you would end up with very less context uh, uh, delays while changing the context. Another advantage of the FCFS scheduling algorithm is that it is fair. As long as no process hogs the CPU, every process will eventually run or in other words, as long as every process terminates at some point, every other process in the ready queue will eventually get to execute in the CPU. Now, the drawback or the disadvantage of the FCFS schedulers as we have seen is that the waiting time depends on the arrival order. So, we have seen the example in the previous slides. Another disadvantage is that short processes are stuck in the ready queue waiting for long processes to complete or rather this is the convoy effect that we have uh, looked at. Now, let us look at another scheduling algorithm known as the shortest job first scheduling algorithm. In this particular scheduling algorithm, the job or the process with the shortest CPU burst time is scheduled before the others. Now, uh, if you have more than one process with the same CPU burst time, then the standard FCFS scheduling is used. There are two variants of the shortest job first scheduling algorithm. The first is the no preemption uh, variant, while the second one is the shortest job first with preemption. Now, in the SJF with no preemption, the process will continue to execute in the CPU until its CPU burst completes. In the second variant with preemption, it may be possible that the process which may get preempted when a new process arrives into the ready queue. We will see more on this later, but first we will start with the shortest job first variant with no preemption. So, let us take the same example that we have seen in the previous case. We had the four pro processes P1 to P4 and all of them are arriving at uh, the instant 0. That is at instant 0, these four processes P1 to P4 get into the ready queue and each of these processes have a different CPU burst time that is 7, 4, 2 and 1 respectively. Now, in the first instant, the CPU scheduler will look at the various uh, burst times and find the one which is minimum. So, in this case, we see that P4 has the minimum CPU burst time. So, that is scheduled first. So, first the process P4 gets scheduled until it completes. Uh, in this particular case, it completes in one cycle. Then, among the remaining three, we see that P3 has the lowest CPU burst time. So, process P3 gets scheduled and completes till and executes till it completes its burst. Then P2 gets scheduled because uh, it has a burst time of 4, while P1 has a higher burst time of 7. And finally, P1 gets to execute till completion. Now, the average wait time if we compute uh, this is 2.75, while the average response time is also 2.75 as in the wait time case. Now, let us look at another example of shortest job first without preemption. So, we will take the same four processes P1 to P4 and uh, each of these processes have the same burst time as before that is 7, 4, 2 and 1 respectively. However, they arrive at div different instance that is the moment the instant in which they enter into the ready queue would be different. So, P1 enters at the 0th instant, P2 in the 2nd instant, 
P 3 at the fourth instant and P 4 in the seventh instant. Now, this is a slight modification in the grant chart, uh, where in addition to showing which process is executing in the CPU, it also shows the order in which processes arrive. It shows that uh, P, P 1 arrives first, then P 2 in the second instant, then P 3 and find finally, P 4 in the seventh instant. Now, when the scheduler begins to execute at this particular instant, the only process that has arrived at, uh, at this particular point is P 1. Therefore, it schedules P 1 to execute. So, P 1 executes for its entire burst that is of 7 cycles and then at this particular cycle, the scheduler enters again or a scheduler executes again and this time it has got 3 processes to choose from all P 2, P 3 as well as P 4 have arrived in the ready queue and out of them P 4 has the shortest burst time. Therefore, it is chosen for execution. Therefore, uh, P 4 executes in the CPU and then P 3 uh, because uh, P 3 has a shorter burst time than P 2 and finally, P 2 gets executed. So, if we compute the average wait time, we see that it is 3 cycles. So, the advantages of the shortest job first scheduling algorithm is that it is optimal, that it will always give you the minimum average waiting time and as a result of this, the average response time also decreases. The main disadvantages of the SJF scheduling algorithm is that it is not practical. Essentially, it is very difficult to predict what the burst time would be. So, another drawback of the SJF scheduling algorithm is that some jobs may get starved. Essentially, if you have a, a process which has an extremely long CPU burst time, then it may never get a chance to actually execute in the CPU. Now, we will look at the shortest job first scheduling algorithm uh, with preemption. So, this is also the shortest remaining time first. So, the basic idea in this uh, algorithm is that if a new process arrives into the ready queue uh, and this process has a shorter burst time then the remaining of the current process, then there is a context switch and the new process gets scheduled into the CPU. This further reduces the average waiting time as well as the average response time. However, as in the previous case uh, that is the shortest job first with no preemption, here also it is not practical. So, let us understand more on this with an example. So, let us take the same example uh, of uh, four processes with burst time 7, 4, 2 and 1 and arrival times at 0, 2, 4 and 7. We will develop the grant chart as the time processes. So, at the instant 0, the only process which is present is P 1 and therefore, the scheduler has no choice but to schedule P 1 onto the CPU. Thus, P 1 would execute for 2 clock cycles. Now, after the second clock cycle, uh, the process P 2 has entered into the ready queue. Now, you see that P 2 has a burst of 4 cycles. However, P 1 has a remaining burst of 5 cycles. So, what we mean by this is that out of the CPU burst time of 7 cycles, P 1 has completed 2 cycles. So, what remains is 5. Now, the scheduler will see that uh, P 1 has 5 cycles, which is greater than P 2, which has a burst of 4 cycles. Therefore, it will do a context switch and schedule P 2 to run. So, P 2 will run for 2 clock cycles and then P 3 arrives at the 4th clock instant. So, at this particular instant, the scheduler will find out that P 3 has a burst time of 2 cycles, while P 2 has a remaining uh, burst time of 2 cycles. We achieve 2 because out of the 4 cycle burst time for P 2, it has completed 2. So, what remains is 2 more cycles. Uh, since P 2 the old process which is running on the CPU has a 2 cycle remaining burst time and P 3 the new process also has 2 ci cycle burst time. Therefore, there is no preemption and P 2 will continue to execute. Now, after P 2 completes in this particular case, P 3 executes for 2 cycles and then P 4 enters. Now, after uh, which uh, if you will verify will not cause any preemption. So, after P 3 completes, uh, the scheduler decides to run either P 4 
or P 1. So, we see that P 4 has a burst cycle of 1, while uh, P 1 has a remaining burst cycle of 5. Therefore, uh, the scheduler will decide to choose P 4 over P 1. So, P 4 runs on the CPU and after it completes, P 1 will execute for its remaining burst time. So, if you compute the average wait time, you see that it reduces to 2.5 while the average response time reduces considerably to 0 0.75. However, as we mentioned before, just like the shortest job first, this scheduling algorithm is also not feasible to be implemented in practice, because it is very difficult to actually identify what a, the burst time of a process is and even more difficult to identify what the remaining burst time of the process would be. Now, we will look at another scheduling alg algorithm known as the round robin scheduling algorithm. So, essentially uh, with the round robin scheduling algorithm, a process runs for a time slice. That is a process executes for a time slice and when the time slice completes, it is moved on to the ready queue. So, in order to achieve this round robin scheduling algorithm, which is also a preemptive scheduling algorithm. Now, in order to achieve the round robin scheduling, we need to configure the timer in the system to interrupt the CPU periodically. At every timer interrupt, the kernel would preempt the current process and choose another process to execute in the CPU. Let us discuss the round robin scheduling algorithm with an example. So, uh, one difference with respect to the other scheduling algorithms that we have seen so far is the notion of time slice. So, this is the grant chart. So, especially see that uh, periodically in this case uh, with the period equal to 2, that is we have keeping a time slice equal to 2, uh, there is a timer interrupt that occurs and the timer interrupt would result in the scheduler being run and potentially an other process being scheduled into the CPU. So, a data structure which is very useful in implementing the round robin scheduling algorithm uh, is the FIFO. So, the, this particular FIFO stores the processes that need to be executed next into the CPU. For example, uh, in this particular case, P 2 is at the top of the FIFO. So, it is the next process which gets executed in the FIFO. So, P 2 gets executed over here. So, for our example, we, we will still consider the four processes as we have done before, that is P 1 to P 4 and we will assume that all of them arrive uh, at the instance 0 and uh, go into the uh, FIFO or the ready queue and uh, they have burst times of 5, 4, 2 and 3 respectively. So, let us say for discussion that the scheduler starts off with this particular order P 1, P 2, P 3 and P 4. So, and it first chooses to execute P 1. So, P 1 executes for 2 cycles and then there is a interrupt which occurs leading to a context switch and then the top of the FIFO in this particular case P 2 gets scheduled into the CPU while P 1 gets pushed into the FIFO. So, P 2 then executes for 2 cycles until the next timer interrupt in which case the time slice uh, of uh, 2 cycles completes and then it gets pushed into the FIFO. So, P, P 2 now is at the bottom of the FIFO while P 3 which is at the top of the FIFO gets scheduled to run. So, in this way, every 2 cycles, a new process may get scheduled into uh, the CPU and execute. So, if we compute the average waiting time, so in this particular case, we will see that the average waiting time and the average response time is different. So, what is the average waiting time for P 1? So, the P 1 executes 2 cycles here, uh, 2 cycles here and a complete execution over here. So, it waits in the in the ready queue in the remaining of the cycles. So, the number of cycles it waits is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, P 1 waits for 9 cycles. Now, P 2 waits for 8 cycles 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. P 3 for 4 cycles and P 4 for 10 cycles. So, the average waiting time is 7.75 cycles. Now, to compute the average response times as we 
defined it before, the response time is the time the process enters into the ready queue to the time it begins to execute in the CPU. That latency would be the response time. So, P 1 for instance has a response time of 0, because it enters into the ready queue or in enters into the FIFO and gets executed immediately. P 2 on the other hand enters in the 0th cycle, but gets to execute only after 2 cycles. So, it has a response time of 2. Similarly, P 3 enters at 0, but executes only at this point. So, uh, at rather at this instant, therefore, it has a response time of 4 and uh, P 4 has a response time of 6, therefore, the average response time is 3. Now, the number of context switches that occur are is 7. So, in this case 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and a context switch occurs over here, because the process P 4 is, is exiting out and uh, P 1 gets continues to execute. So, the number of context switches over here are 7 that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and the seventh context switch occurs over here when P 4 exits and P 1 gets switched into the CPU. Now, let us take another more complex example of round robin scheduling, where we also have arrival times which are not the same. So, P 1 is arriving at the 0th instant, uh, P 2 at the second, P 3 and uh, P 4 at the third and ninth respectively. So, we can similarly draw the grand chart and the states of the FIFO for this case. So, to start with in the 0th instant, the only process which has arrived is P 1 and therefore, P 1 executes uh, for 2 cycles and uh, at this particular point uh, when the timer interrupt occurs, no other process is present as yet. Therefore, P 1 will continue to execute for another 2 cycles for another time slice. However, in this time slice, we have 2 processes which have entered into the ready queue. These are the process P 2 and P 3. So, P 2 arrives at this interval, while P 3 arrives at this interval and uh, they get added into the P 4. So, at the second time slice completion, there is a context switch and P 2 gets scheduled into, into the CPU to execute, while P 1 which was executing will then go into the FIFO. So, P 2 executes for 2 cycles, uh, then P 3 executes for 2 cycles, then P 1 executes for 2 cycles and at that time P 4 has arrived and gets added into the uh, FIFO. So, now we have 3 processes P 1, P 2 and P 4 and these get scheduled to run over a period of time. So, the average waiting time in this case is 4.75, while the average response time is 2. So, how is the average waiting time uh, 4.75? It means that process P 1 has waited for 7 cycles, so uh, before it completes. So, that is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7, while process P 2 has waited for 6 cycles. So, it is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, process 3 has waited for 3 cycles and uh, process 4 has wait, waited for 3 cycles. The average response time can be verified to be equal to 2 and the number of context switches was as before 7. Now, let us take the same example as we have done before, but with a time slice of 1, that is we have reduced the time slice from 2 uh, and we have made it 1. So, we see that in every instant we have a timer interrupt and potentially a context switch that can occur. If we compute the average waiting time and average response time for this particular case, we see that the average response time in particular has reduced. Why has this occurred? Is because once a process has entered into the queue, it has to wait for lesser cycles before it gets scheduled into the CPU. On the other hand, the number of context switches has increased from 7 to 11. Since we are having timer interrupts which are more frequent, therefore, there is more likely that a context switch will occur. 
Now, if we take the same example, but with a time slice of 5 instead of 1 and if we compute the average waiting time and average response time, we see that the response time increases considerably to 2.75, while the number of context switches reduces quite a bit to 4. On the other hand, we see that the scheduling begins to behave more and more like the first come first serve. The response time is bad because due to the large time slice, the scheduling behaves more and more like the first come first serve, which we know has a bad response time. So, from all these examples that we have seen so far, we seen we can conclude that the uh, duration of a time slice is very critical. So, it affects both the response time as well as uh, the number of context switches. So, essentially if we have a, a time slice which is of a very short quantum, the advantage is that processes need not wait too long in the ready queue before they get scheduled into the CPU. Essentially this means that the uh, response time of the process would be very good or uh, it would have a less response time. On the other hand, having a short time slice is bad because we would have very frequent context switches and as we have seen before, context switches could have considerable overheads. Therefore, it degrades the performance of the system. A long time slice or a long quantum has the drawback that processes no longer appear to execute concurrently. It appears more like a first come first serve type of scheduling algorithm. And so, this again in turn may degrade uh, system performance. So, typically in a modern day operating systems, the time slice duration is kept anything from 10 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. So, XV6 programs uh, programs the timer to interrupt every 10 milliseconds. So, the advantage of the round robin scheduling algorithm is as follows. The algorithm is fair because each process gets a fair chance to run on the CPU. Uh, the average wait time is low, especially when the burst times uh, vary and uh, the response time is very good. On the other hand, the, the drawbacks of the round robin scheduling algorithm are as follows. There is an increased number of context switching that occurs and as we have seen uh, before, context switching has considerable overheads. And the second drawback is that the average wait time is high, especially when the burst times have equal lengths. Uh, the XP6 scheduling policy is a variant of the round robin scheduling policy. Uh, the source code is shown over here. So, essentially what uh, the XP6 scheduler does is that it parses through the p table array. So, we have seen p table before uh, which is an array of uh, procs and the scheduler parses through this particular array and finds the next process that is runnable and uh, invokes the switch. So, this is where you invoke the context switch. So, every time the scheduler executes, the next process in this array that is runnable gets scheduled to execute. So, next we will see scheduling algorithms which are based on priority. So, these are the priority based scheduling algorithms. Thank you.